You're listening to Forever Fierce with Catherine Grace O'Connell, only on L.A. Talk Radio. Welcome to Forever Fierce. I'm Catherine Grace O'Connell, and we're actually shooting a double show today in studio, which you guys are going to be seeing this a little further down the road, but we are back in studio after a bit of a break um, on the road, taking road shows, and I have my my co-host today is, as you guys may have seen before, Michael Castagna is my business manager slash partner here, and I allowed him in studio again today. Well, allowed yeah, him in. This is a lot easier because <laughs> when it's on the road, I have just a crap load of work to do. This is just, you come in, get a microphone in front of me and talk. I can do that. You can, you it's a lot can, easier. You can, well, every once in a while you can do that. You're kind, of a, you're kind of a quiet, hermetic type of guy. No, that's only because I can't get words in edgewise when you are speaking. Really? So, yeah, I have to that's interrupt. Funny. That's funny. I thought I was kind of a shy little flower myself, yeah. but whatever. Okay. So you guys... No, you know, actually, though, it's good yeah. after you had the hiatus. I was really worried that you wouldn't be, you know, on yeah. your A-game, but that last show was fantastic. Uh, and I, I expect this one to be as well. Yeah, it's, it's fun. Might as well dive in and, and come back with a bang with a double show. Yeah, we had a lovely time out in um, Massachusetts. We went to Newburyport, Massachusetts. If you guys happen to catch the show with Cheryl Richardson, who I have uh, been stalking forever. St- I always say stalking, and it's really in a positive way. I and I thought it was really gracious of her t- after having been stalked for you, you know, by twenty for twenty years that she agreed to come on your show, and that was that was that was really a, a great experience to have her on the show. That yeah, was it was a, it was a dream come true. And I, having followed Cheryl, if you guys don't know, Cheryl Richardson is on Instagram. She's Coach on Call. She also has her own website, Cheryl Richardson, and she did an entire year long series with Oprah, and um, traveled with Oprah. I mean, I have I've followed her forever, and really look to her because she's now a midlife woman and had written a book called Waking Up in Winter all about her real personal journey as a woman at midlife. So it was um, an amazing experience and hope you guys saw that show. And today, actually, we are bringing on a midlife man. We, and that's another reason we've got, we've got Mr. Mike here to have really a nice male perspective and, and balance because um, there's a lot of things going on in the world right now with, um, you know, Me Too and Time's Up and all these movements and obviously the Kavanaugh hearings. And so it's really important to bring, I think, the men into the conversation and to really understand their experience through all this. So with that, I want to introduce my guest today. My guest today is Jeff Brown. And Jeff Brown, he calls himself, well, an author, a filmmaker, and a grounded spiritualist. Um, His website is soulshaping.com. He is the author of many books. So his first book, I believe, is Soul Shaping. And then Uncommon Bond is one of his most recent, although he has one he's going to talk about today that is available for pre-sale on Amazon. And then Spiritual Graffiti, which is a, a really lovely book that really dives into what he calls not the new age, but the new cage movement. So with that, I am delighted to introduce Jeff Brown and welcome him to the show. Welcome, Jeff. Delighted to be here. Thank you, Catherine. Thanks for having me here. You bet. So let's start at the very beginning here. You call yourself a grounded spiritualist, and we'll get into your story, but I think I'd like our audience to kind of get to know you from that you're you're a master of language so what is a grounded spiritualist i should pull out my definition um (laughs) the new book i mean i think that you know for me i'm not sure that there's any difference for me between what i call spirituality and a more grounded consciousness actually um so I think that, you know, through my years of exposure to this thing we call spirituality and often accept as spiritual, um, I came to believe that a lot of it really wasn't spiritual at all because it wasn't earthbound, it wasn't reality-based, it was often just transcendent or dissociative and disconnected from our human experience. And so for me, when I call myself a grounded spiritualist, what I mean is that my understanding of spirituality um, is really earth-centered self-honoring and is indistinguishable in many ways, my notion of spirituality from my humanist itself. 
That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. And you are also someone that I have been following online for quite some time. As I said, you have, you know, linguistics are powerful. The way we use language, and I think you've said many times, you know, we need to have a new conversation, um, really change the language that we use around um, relationships and, like you said, in the spiritual realm. So let's go back to you, this transformation and your own process of reinvention. So you have a powerful backstory of how you were going in one path, one trajectory in criminal law, and then you had sort of an inner voice that screamed at you, I guess. I'll, I'll let you tell it in your own words. I'd love for you to share that story with our audience. Yeah, I was. Uh, I felt called to become a criminal lawyer um, up here in Canada, and I articled was articling or apprenticing uh, for, I guess, our most famous criminal lawyer, a guy named Eddie Greenspan up here. Um, he was doing a pretty high-profile murder trial. He was running for office examinations and not sleeping and just living trial law. Um, and then after that was done, I was about to be called to the bar. And, and I should say, before all of that happened, I always sort of had a vision of my life as moving, beginning with criminal law as a career, moving into some kind of psychotherapeutic work and ultimately writing. It was it seemed like a pre-encoded or predestined path inside of me. Um, I didn't have language for it then, but I but I saw glimpses of possibility beyond law. Um, and so after Eddie and I were done and we did a big trial, we won the trial, and I had sort of a taste of what it was like to be at the upper echelon of that profession as a student. Um, just before being called to the bar, this part of me that I called Little Missy, which was like my uh, inner diamond or, or guiding angel, pushed up against me and told me not to practice trial law. Um, you know, I couldn't sleep at night. I had what Dan Groff refers to in his writing as a spiritual emergency, and I was just at war with myself. Um, I've had to sign an office lease with a bunch of guys to start practicing, and yet some other part of me said that I was done with that path and that I was here to walk another path. Um, and so I went to war with myself. I was used to going to war with the outer world. Now I really had to go uh, to war internally, and through many stages in the process that I really wrote about um, in, the, in the early chapters in Soul Shaping, I arrived at the decision to walk away from law and to walk in, in the direction of really what was unknown to me. You know, um, I had what I called truth aches. Um, so those are, you know, like indicators from within that you're not honoring your truest path. And, and, and in that case, in the career sense, and uh, allowed myself to surrender to this not knowing, which was everything against my male condition, my whole condition structure was about knowing who I was, defining who I was, being egoically strong and clear. So I had to move in a very new and unfamiliar direction and allow myself to surrender to feelings and to look for my path in all kinds of unexpected places. And so ultimately I reached the stage where it was time to write and, and, and to fully accept that I was never going to walk back in the direction of criminal life. So you talk a lot about the questions, and in your books you, you speak of living the question. So what does that mean? Yeah, yeah. I think it just means embracing your confusion and mm -hmm. surrendering to the not knowing. You know, I use the term depth charges and soul shaping, the idea that you make efforts, you accept that you don't know something, you accept that you don't know whether a connection fits or whether a career direction fits, so, and, and that you need more information. So you, you can either surrender. There's two things you can do. You can surrender to your body. You can surrender to your emotional process. You can clear all that emotional debris that obstructs your consciousness and your clarity um, because the answer probably does lie somewhere within your bones. I believe path is encoded and embedded within us in, in the bones of our being. And, and, or you can depth charge. You can deliberately go out into the world and explore all kinds of different things in order to get information back to you from your lived experience as to which direction is the, is the direction for you. And I did both. At first, when I stepped back from law, not with a permanence, I wasn't sure that I was never going to go back. I had an intuition I was, but wasn't going to go back, but I wasn't certain. I just lay on the couch and started feeling all kinds of stuff that I had been pushing down in order to build my life. Um, so there was a long period of time where I was just surrendering to the not knowing and feeling inside of myself, something that an externally focused guy didn't know much about. And, and then at a certain point, I'd kind of done enough of that, and I started to have experiences and move outward with my energy or to explore other pathways. So 
so that at the end of the day, I would have internal and external information coalescing and coming together and giving me real clarity as to where to, to walk next. So you talk a lot about being at war with yourself, and you let's let's go back to your childhood because I know you had a tumultuous childhood, and you talk a lot about really growing up in an environment where it was constant um, battle, right? And let's yeah. let's take it from there and how that really molded you, and you had went through this wake up call later on, and all this stuff from your childhood came resurfacing. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's always happening if you're making an effort to become genuinely more conscious in your life. I mean, it's hard to sidestep the material, but yeah, you know, before, after I did a year of law school, I did a two-year sabbatical just to do therapy and to sort of catch up with myself emotionally because I would had to put so many things away in order to adapt to my reality and to build my life from nothing. I didn't come from money, and I had to build all the structures myself, and and then after I went and worked with Eddie and then was called to the bar, I again stepped back and allowed myself to surrender to more, a more deep, a depthful emotional process. And then went and explored some notions of spirituality and meditation, different things that were defined as spiritual. And then went to the next level with my emotional process. I began to do somatic psychotherapy. I joined the bioenergetic training program. Alexander Lowen, the co-founder, was my therapist for a while. I was trained down to Connecticut to work with him. And and then I went deeper and deeper into and finding, you know, peeling the onion, really, of your consciousness. I mean, it's, we all know how hard that is to do, but you have to adapt to the survivalist world. But somehow I was able to sort of function in the survivalist world and then step back and go inside and do people work and then step back out into the world each time like a newly constituted version of me. Um, and then at some point along the way, I was able to then move into the writing journey and then uncover a whole other player you know, unresolved emotional material, not just individual material, probably collective material, archetypal material. I mean, we're, those of us who are doing this deep work, we're really like trailblazers because I feel like we're doing the work for generation after generation that was trapped in a survivalist consciousness and, and couldn't go inside of this process. And so, you know, the process it still continues. It's not as um, complex as it used to be. It's not as blinding as it used to be, but Mike, how do you relate to that as a, as a man and the emotional sort of inner journey? I guess the question I, I, w- I would ask and I'd be curious about is as you go through that process, Jeff, what is the biggest driver? What's, what is really the most important thing personally to you? Is it the self-actualization that's occurring or is it the ability to take that self-actualization and, and hopefully reach a bunch of other people. So uh, I guess what I'm asking you, is it really is it the internal or is it the helping of the external? Right. Well, you know, I think that I always had a sense that whatever my work was, it was going to uh, positively impact others. You know, they we're always in a relational field. Um, but I do think that the first steps in the process, for me at least, were to do a lot of lone wolf warrior consciousness work, like within myself, and, you know, I always had a, a desire to, and self-actualization was the term that was really up then, and that was really up in my own awareness, that, you know, I would read Maslow as a kid, and I, I really loved the idea of, you know, pulling my car out of this place that we got stuck in this crazy family and finding my way somehow to the light and becoming all that I was meant to become. I used to love this saying, uh, I think it was a John Denver lyric, all that, all that you're meant to be, not what you are, something like that. The, this and themes like never surrender, you know, musical themes, these things were what it was all about for me. Um, I never imagined that, you know, every time I would go into the woods to do this inner work, I never imagined myself staying there. I wasn't a guy who was going to stay in a meditation cave and reach for something called enlightenment independent of my relations to others. I was always an in the world person and always believed ultimately whatever I was doing, the fruits of my labor were going to lead to being able to help other people. And, you know, so at some point, there's a, a Ram Rambach quote, I think, you have to become something before you become nothing, and when you become nothing, you become everything. I don't like the emphasis on the becoming nothing part, I think that's part of patriarchal spirituality, but what I do like about the quote is the idea is that once you're kind of done with the self, like you reach a point of enough um, actualization, there's a natural tendency to first of spill over into the uh, helping of others. And, I think that's exactly what's happened. Now I don't find those two experiences 
self-actualization and societal actualization is, is even distinguishable from each other. But the first I did. And you have worked with some, or at least in your in your book, a lot of the um, testimonials you have are some really incredible people in the spiritual world. From um, let's see, I think it's um, Lisa um, Raskin to uh, Araya Mountain Dreamer. I mean, just a, a wealth of amazing people. But you also talk in there very openly, like I said, what you call the New Cage Movement versus the New Age Movement, and this whole concept of spiritual bypass. So please share, you know, your thoughts and what you've learned in the New Age world about being discerning and what is a spiritual bypass? Yeah. Um, so the way, this was a term that John Wellwood created in 1984. I think it was a, an academic piece, actually. Um, and what it basically means is that you're using this thing called spirituality to bypass your unresolved material. So, you know, you turn towards spirituality because you don't want to deal with your humanness. And, you know, as I look deeper, so at first I kind of understood this in my own process, or I would read some of the writers in the field, and I'd look through their book and go, this is just spiritual bypass. This is self-avoidance masquerading as enlightenment. It's all over the industry. In fact, it may be the entire industry. Um, and as I went farther into it, I began to see that it was everywhere. I mean, it was that this bifurcation, this splitting between what we call spirituality and humanness was at the heart of the system. Um, and that in my experience, I, I had a deeper and more expansive experience of a unity field the more I went into my humanness, the more I worked through my psychotherapeutic material, the more I healed emotionally, the more I and matured emotionally, the more I matured spiritually. So I began to think about wh whether or not, in fact, this term was appropriate. So now the term spiritual bypass is to use freely. I'm not even sure it's the right term. I like transcendence bypass better. Because I feel like what people are doing to bypass reality is not actually going to spirituality or by the planet, which is reality and a grounded experience. They're actually going somewhere that's not spiritual at all. We've all been fed this karmic bill of goods, but that's spirituality. But nobody really asks a very basic preliminary question, which we can ask right here today, which is what are we even talking about when we use the word spirituality? What does it mean to be a spiritual person? Well, a big part of being a spiritual person that you talk about is having a healthy ego. And we've, we've, ego's gotten a bad yeah. rap, hasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's all part of this bifurcated game where we're calling spirituality this thing that isn't human, you know? And you can see why patriarchal spirituality would have developed this. They want to deal with their feelings. They didn't want to deal with any of their humanness. It was all too bloody difficult and painful. So all of a sudden, the enlightenment field became something disconnected from the self. The self's not real. The story is not real. The ego is not healthy. The body is not even real. Your personal identifications are real. Your feelings are real. None of it is real. So what's real is plummeting into the expansive eternal emptiness in a meditative field connected to something called the absolute or pure self, which in my view doesn't even exist. Um, you know, so for me, all of this, that whole system is not remotely spiritual. And the bashing of the ego was one of my first giveaways. It was like, wait a minute. If I dissipate my entire ego, I can't function. I can't write a word. I can't talk to you in this radio show. I can't do any of this. So I began to understand there was a difference between the sort of malignant or narcissistic unhealthy ego and then the healthy, sturdy, strong self-concept and ego that we're developing in the West, the wisdom of the West. And that was another way of my understanding that what we were calling spirituality was really oppositional to the human experience rather than inclusive and integrative. How do you feel about that one? Well, I, I kind of want to just drill in a little bit. You use the word warrior mm -hmm. quite a bit in your writings, Jeff. And the word warrior is like, you know, Catherine has a group that she uses the word fierce all the time. And fierce has different connotations to different people. And I'm just curious as right. what you mean when you say warrior, because there's, you know, when I hear warrior, I may think of chivalry or someone else hears warrior. They may think of yeah. someone who's, you know, cutthroat. So how, how, what does that mean to you? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I'm with, I've, I've begun to have some difficulty with the word because of the connotations of the word. And the way that what helped me, the way I understood it when I was younger, was that I was somebody who was willing to assert or fight for my rights and other people's rights to the light. That's how I thought of it. But of course, that's not how we always think of a warrior. Quite often, a warrior is malevolent. So I, I think as my work has developed, 
I'm comfortable with the word if we make a distinction between the malevolent or the unconscious warrior and the benevolent or an awakening warrior. Um, then the word makes sense to me. So when I call myself a warrior, which I very seldom ever do, I'm talking about my willingness uh, to fight for the right to the light, to live a brave and focused life and an attempt to uh, develop myself and have a positive impact on humanity. Um, a benevolent warrior. Um, and I, and I, but I, I'm, not, I'm not as comfortable with the word as I used to be. Well, I'd love to, to transition right over here into your, you have a beautiful apologies to the divine feminine on your um, website. It says, from a warrior in transition, so that really um, plays off very well of what you just said. And I want to just read, um, obviously it's a very long and beautiful kind of soliloquy, but I want to read, so you say, please don't give up on me or my fellow warriors. Forgive us our misdeeds or at the least be open to the possibility that we will change as the trail expands to meet our shifting intentionality. The day will come when our warrior spirit loses its harsh edge and comes into alignment with benevolent action. Some of us are already there and many of us, many more of us will follow. The road to transformation is dependent on a bridge between genders, a benevolent bridge that celebrates our differences with respect and kindness. So share a little bit more about what you mean and, and what moved you to really write this letter and does it have anything to do with all the things that are happening right now with Me Too and Time's Up and all the shifts and changes going on? Well, I wrote that piece, uh, Apologies to the Divine Feminine, went viral in the fall of uh, 2010. I just wrote it originally as a note on Facebook. It was just another thing that was coming through me that wanted to be expressed. I know that I had wanted to write it a few years earlier had started to write it and somehow just didn't feel like either I was ready for the aftermath of it or that it was really the right time culturally. I don't know. But then one day it just came through me very quickly. I put it on Facebook and it went nuts. Um, so, you know, it's one of many things that I, I guess you could say is a precursor to what's happening now. And, you know, it, it partly came from my own process around internally distinguishing the malevolent warrior, really understanding the subtle and remarkable differences between that malevolent warrior, that is, if I got too jacked up in that assertive side to myself, it could easily go in a dark direction, or it could go in a much brighter lit direction. And I became very aware of the differences inside of myself. What am I going to do with this energy? In which direction am I going to take it? Um, and a lot of it had to do with my dynamic with my grandmother. After the love experience that I wrote about uh, that inspired an uncommon bond, um, you know, I finally had an experience of a deep heartbreak uh, on a level that I protected and defended myself against as a good little conditioned male warrior for many years. And, you know, after I had that experience, the world looked different. And I would watch my grandmother, who used to seem so annoying, asking me to, if I had eaten enough, and if I was warm enough, you know, as, as some kind of an annoying, you know, person. And my grandfather would go off in the marketplace and slay dragons and make money and somehow elevate it. And, after this experience, the real love experience and, the, and the, the challenges around that, I began to just see the world differently. I began to see her in a much more honoring and elevated way. Um, and somehow all those parts just coalesced when it was time to write that piece. And I didn't feel like I was writing it for me. I, I'm not speaking to exactly my experience in parts of that piece, but I felt like I was speaking for a lot of men who have been conditioned in a certain way, locked into patriarchal structures, um, and that it was just that's the next step, you know, for humankind. A lot of New Agers would say we don't need to make apology. We'll be on that now. But as a more grounded person, I felt like that's ridiculous. What world are you living in? I mean, we need to make apology. We need to acknowledge the error of our ways, both to liberate us and to liberate humanity. And, and yeah, so that piece had a lot of things pointing in the direction of it at the time that it, it was written, and uh, and felt really congruent with my ultimate and my view of where we need to go next. Sounds like you're very prophetic, um, really seeing things really before they kind of exploded here. So you talk very openly about your own relationships and your evolution of really learning what true love is. And you talk about it as love, and it's a very highly conscious love. So what have you learned? Like, what is true love? And um, how does that make a healthier relationship with someone? Well, I think that it's it's a blend of um, what we used to call love and, and then something more grounded. Um, what I now call soulmates in, in my writing, in Uncommon Bond and in the book I'm writing now. You know, so that it, it combines the capacity for ecstatic experience, 
which is what I was kind of conditioned to believe or wanted to believe was love. And then the more earthbound experiencing of integrating and weaving uh, those emotional states with your functioning in day-to-day life so that you end up meeting somehow in the middle, like a combination of a love ship and a relationship. I mean, they have all kinds of language for this in the writing, but, you know, so that you never, you know, you never get too carried away with the idea that it's all perfect because given that we're carrying so many threads of unresolved material, you know, triggers and trauma and transference, that you move into those more elegant and lovely states and stages, but you also allow yourself to also integrate in your day-to-day experience the reality of practical life and the reality of the unresolved shadow that's always so close to the surface of our consciousness. So, my dear- In other words, are you trying to film it? It's just all here. I mean, we're just, we're here for all of it. Um, and that our idea of love has to encompass that idea. So Mike, you and Jeff kind of grew up in the, around the same generation and back in the day, and I know they say that dates you about whatever, um, you were really taught to mask emotions, or I don't know if that's the right language, but to not show emotions and not, you know, girls could cry openly, but guys can't. So what Jeff is talking about really is moving into this inner world and being more real and feeling these feelings in a really deep way in order to release them and heal them. How do you, how does that relate to you well i'd probably i would throw it back to jeff and by making a statement and see if he agrees with me i think a lot of the things that we're seeing in the world today um and you know whether you look at it in politics or culture or relationships are really our struggle as we go forward to equalize the difference between the masculine and the feminine um we have and to me the the relationships between males and females is, is very much like the whole issue with racism. Everyone's got a little bit of it in them, and we don't treat people equally. Um, And part of that, the question is, is it all our upbringing? Because when we did grow up, you know, I'm 57 years old, so uh, when I grew up, that was at a time in the the 70s and and late 60s where, um, you know, equality for women, equality for races was all just beginning. And we all bore with us some sort of environmental... Uh, education that we had that imprinted us with that and and to me life's been a struggle through that period to throw away the crap that we were given to throw away probably thousands of years of patriarchal society um, to have equality and to understand each other on because we are different that it'd be stupid to say males and females are are not different we are Um, but really to learn what our strengths and weaknesses are and how we can meld those things and that's kind of my thought I don't know what you think about that I think that, I mean, you covered so much ground. I yeah, mean, I think we, <laughs> sorry that was, about that. That. Was not, that was not a Tammy soundbite. I'm bite. sorry about that. <laughs> what, do, what do I think about the meaning of life in 12? I mean, yeah, yeah, right, exactly. I mean, I, I, Just a light one. I mean, I think I think we have dishonored the feminine um, for centuries. I think it's utterly ridiculous. I think our species is doomed if it doesn't stop right now. Uh, if I had my way, I would just hand the reins over to the women for the next 500 years in the hope that they can save us. I like I, that. You know, I get that, the, I get that page, and I'm not saying this to schmooze anyone. This is how I deeply feel. Um, I, you know, I think that whatever, wherever patriarchy emanated from, social, there are sociological reasons for all kinds of things, coming from a survivalist energy to a more authentic one. You know, there, I get there's steps along the way. Um, but I think that in my individual work, which is where it started, I do feel as though I was trying to come into harmony with my masculine and my feminine. I was way imbalanced. I survived using and relying mostly on my masculine. Now, having said that, I cried a lot and tantrumed a lot in the early years. I was super emotional, and I think it actually allowed me to remain sane. Um, and then I got fell into my conditioning, put all those feelings away, and went through the therapeutic process to reclaim my capacity to feel. So many men are walking around the world, and not just men. Um, Of course, many of us are armored in our consciousness, and the work really is to be able to reintegrate with the world of feeling. Because if you're not feeling things, you're not here. That's why I dislike ungrounded spirituality. There's so much about moving away from the world of feeling to this sort of pseudo-equanimity experience. To me, feeling is everything. The feel is for real. Um, And so that's been so much my work, and I think... It's not just about gender. I think we're coming from a survivalist structure where almost all of us 
defined who we are by what's put food on the table. And now to move and begin to cross the bridge to a more authentic way of being, where we define who we are, we still have to survive, but we primarily define who we are by what our callings are, what our sacred of purpose is, why are we here on this earth as individuals and as a collective, forces us to break down these ridiculous polarities between masculine and feminine, and to allow ourselves to move in to a more inclusive consciousness, because if we don't become more inclusive in our consciousness, we can't figure out why we're here. We're just all lost and stumbling about. Um, and sure, we'll retain some degree of something called what it means to be a man and something called what it means to be a woman, but it won't be coming from this dysfunctional place. It will be coming from a healthier and more actualized place. And I think that's what's happening in everywhere now, and I think you allude to that. And I, I feel that's really, I think it's really beautifully true. The only question is, is are we going to do it in time? Yeah. Are we going to do it before we implode? Well, you said an interesting word in there, survivalist. And in a lot of the things I read or interviews I watched of you, you bring up fear a lot. And you bring up fear in relationship to the New Age movement and sort of these gurus preying on, you know, people. So please share, you know, what what do you feel about fear? And how do we um, become aware of when we're, I guess, being motivated by fear versus being motivated by, you know, a higher purpose? Well, I don't usually, I don't like the term higher, um, because I think that's, uh, and not to be difficult, but I think that's part of this whole hierarchical notion uh, of spirituality and, and development. I think it's about becoming deeper, truer, um, and more horizontal, more than, rather than higher. Perfect. I think that's part of our buy Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but, and I just wrote a paragraph on it. That's why it's up for me. But, <laughs> you know, in terms of, I mean, I think fear is intrinsic to a survivalist structure. I think the unconscious media, and I'm focusing on the unconscious media, not all of the media, preys on the fact that our survivalist anxieties are right up near the surface of our consciousness at all times. And I think this is all of our work now is, you know, to end, especially right now, because it's all over us and there we're being played on this level. Our survivalist triggers are up all over the place. People are crazy from this now because they can't calm down into a more authentic consciousness because the worry mind is so active and the worry body is so active. So I think it's what, what helped me was to begin to get conscious, and I use the term conscious armoring as an example. So understanding that there are times when you have to move into the world and into life and to put some armor on, to deal with that which you're afraid of, that which you should be afraid of, but to become aware of when the time comes to take it off, for example, to drop back into a more surrendered or receptive way of being. Um, I think that's one tool that would help everybody so that we don't just live in our armor or react against it and always live in a surrendered, sort of softy toffy consciousness, but we allow ourselves to choice make with respect to how we respond to those things that we're afraid of. Yeah, so what I'm hearing is, yeah, the more conscious we are, the more we can be aware of our own triggers, because I think there was another interview where you said something that was so real that, you know, when you were growing up, like you said, in this warring environment, you had this unconscious programming, and things happened so fast, it was like almost this constant reactionary, um, where you weren't even aware that you were consciously, you know, unconsciously reacting to everything the same way, the same behaviors, and all of a sudden... You know that changed clearly and you had this wake-up call and you were able to become aware and more conscious in order to change yeah I mean you have to have at some point along the way you have to allow yourself to have a different kind of experience than the one that you've adapted to because if you all you know is what you've adapted to and you just keep perpetuating that if you never step out of what I call your habitual range of emotion then you never know that there's another way of being available to you. And that's why some of the ungrounded spiritualities are helpful on stage one, if they allow you to step back, pull up and out of what they call the monkey mind, and I call the monkey heart. But either way, you get like a little bit of a broader perspective on who you are, how you operate, what neurotic material is moving through you. Um, the trick is not to stay out there and to keep flying away, because then you don't get anywhere. You have to then come back down and weave that perspective in with your moment-to-moment experience. And, and it gives you an opportunity to expand your range of emotion and your range of movement and how you operate as a way of being in the world. And I think that's been so much of my own work, is trying to be witnessing and aware of how I limit my consciousness but at the same time not stay in the witness for too long because I have to come back into experience 
and find a way to expand that container a little bit more all the time. And I think that's the nature of the work. And a lot of people, you know, all they know is the same trick over and over and over again, and that's a real problem. We've got to step out of our trip if we're going to realize that there's someone, someone else we can be in this lifetime. And I love the way you changed the languaging that I was using from higher to deeper. And clearly you're a master of language. Why is it so important um, to be awake and aware of Can you hear me? I don't like I don't like the word master, so I will go ahead. Okay. okay, well, yeah, no, master guru, but I mean, okay, master, uh, just, okay, so you are clearly very gifted in the use of language, so why is it so important for us to be conscious and aware of the language that we use in out in the world, but also the thoughts that we have about ourselves and about others? Yeah, there's just, I just feel like um, sort of the shaming of the collective is everywhere, and it's intrinsic to our language, and our language has been limited. So I think when I started to craft language in terms, and I think a lot of people are doing this um, as well, and certainly are doing it now in, on the net, um, I think I was realizing I felt confined by language. I, I, I felt like it wasn't speaking to the unique experience that I was trying to have of whatever you know sacred purpose was. So I would hear the term divine purpose, and it was like, oh, well, that, that feels better than nothing. It was like, that doesn't really feel right. It was like, in some way, I'm desacralizing the self and focusing on the divinity of my purpose. Not to say our purpose isn't divine, but it felt like really the work was to find the sacredness of my purpose within my own body. And I felt like this term divine purpose was just another way that we connect or desacralize our selfhood. And that it was time to find language, not for others, I was just trying to make sense of my own experience that covered what was happening for me in the direction I wanted to go. And I think it's absolutely essential, you know, so the term nervous breakdown versus nervous breakthrough, which I had coined in soul shaping, and it turns out many other people have done that. Yeah, I I had one of those. (laughs) I definitely had one of those. So you were, I remember you were at a talk, I believe it was with Ram Dass, and Ram Dass was talking about that very, um, be it concept of these these wake-up calls, these breakdowns to breakthroughs, and, you know, he had a stroke, and, you know, I had a a, a life-threatening experience and almost lost my life and, you know, woke up. So why is it so many women, why do you think, wake up or forced to wake up by the universe at midlife. By the universe or? At midlife, at Ooh. midlife. You know, right? there's so many of us waking oh. up at midlife. Oh. Right, okay, so I think we're waking down. Waking but, down, <laughs> okay, waking down, waking deeper. <laughs> uh, right, but, I, but I, I, I believe that this is happening because the survivalist structure is just not gratifying us. Defining who we are by what puts food on the table and based on the roles and duties that are familiar to us is not adequate. And as the culture begins to move a little bit more towards an authentic way of being, where we define who we are by who we really are and why we're really here, what calls us, or what I call sacred purpose, you know, it starts to get uncomfortable internally. Our entelechy or our uh, what James Hillman called the innate image is pushing up against us and saying, I want more for you. I want... Um, something truer for you. You are not inhabiting the field of consciousness that is deep within your encoded purpose in this lifetime. And as we evolve, it's getting harder and harder to cram ourselves into the Trumpian survivalist, define yourself through these very practical ways, because we want to move in the direction of a more expansive experience. We want to move towards wholeness, and it's not gratifying us. And I think that, you know, at first it was men having these, allegedly having these midlife crises. Um, but I, I think now it's happening, thankfully, a lot more for women as well because they're tired of it. It's, it's, it. We're meant for so much more. We're such magnificent beings, and we are just meant for so much more than slotting ourselves into these survivalist structures. Yeah, we got to survive. I mean, that's grounded reality. How but much? We also are in many things. We can craft a reality that encompasses something more than that. Go ahead. How much of, of you know what you're saying here? Because I have a little bit. I'm not sure if it's a different perspective, but you know, one of Catherine's wonderful accomplishments is really to work with a lot of women at midlife, and that you know, midlife is is undefined. It can be you know, 35 years old, it can be 40, 45, 50, 60. It really depends. Each woman defines her midlife on her own. What I sense in that demographic and in that grouping is that they have been sung a lullaby 
for a very long time, for many decades. Yeah. And it's, it's created a sleepiness. And that lullaby is, is stopping. And I don't know if that's because as you get into midlife, the generation before who maybe sung the lullaby to you is passing on, or people are just waking up. And that's what I sense in this group that Catherine's created, is, is they're waking up to their yeah. internal power. I mean, most I do a writing course uh, twice a year with hundreds of people, and almost all of them are women from 35 to 65, basically, and who really want to deal more truly and deeply with the emotional process, and they want a male teacher or facilitator to hold the space for that, because that's often been what's missing. You know, they've had such unsafe experiences throughout their lives. And I think what's happening is called soul, is soulfulness. I, I just think that the soul itself comes in emblazoned with purpose. So I think that this demographic, this group of people who are uh, probably more in touch emotionally than many men are in the, that time, in the, that age grouping, um, are wanting to, and, and I don't distinguish the emotional process from the soulful process. To me, it's all the same thing. And I think that they're just tired of not having lives that honor this brilliant soulfulness and this embodied possibility that lives inside of them. And, and because they're a little closer to the emotional terrain, as the culture starts to move in the direction of awakening, I think it makes sense that this group would really be awakening. Um, because for a lot of my brothers, they, they, they don't even know what they feel. And if you don't know what you feel, it's a little hard to get clear on what frustrates you. It's, you know, it ends up coming through in all kinds of weird, passive aggressive and aggressive ways because there's not enough attunement. But a, a lot of women have more attunement than our brothers. And, and the soul is waking up. Um, and once the soul wakes up, it's pretty impossible to put it back to sleep. Yeah, that's why it's hard to put back in that in that box. Well, you touch yeah. on something, the emotions. I think that's really important because we have this perception out there in this new agey world, like if you are this person on this higher consciousness path and you are an enlightened being, you don't have anger and you don't have, you know, and you talk about when you've got a space in your house where you punch something or, you know, you got to go scream it out or, you know, I think that's really important to distinguish that and to give, you know, men, women permission to let those emotions out because you can't elevate in consciousness unless you feel these things and let these feelings out. Is that right? I mean, I, I don't, I, I just have never understood a notion of spiritual development that doesn't include, again, emotional process. So to me, healthy anger, I mean, I get why anger has been vilified. So much damage has been done, but if we don't, you know, for example, what I learned within myself is if I couldn't activate my anger, I couldn't activate my vulnerability because my inner child needed to know that somebody, and it had to be me, had the capacity to assert itself before it was willing to drop down and reveal itself vulnerably. It, I couldn't roar. If I couldn't roar, I couldn't touch into my surrendered self. So that's just one example of it. But, you know, these it's very easy to control people as a spiritual teacher or as a guru if you control their emotions and if you deny the veracity of their stories and their identifications. Once you throw all of that away, they don't have a center anymore. Yeah, you talk they about that. Uh, sorry, you talked about that in your criminal background. You said that's really a big part of the process, right? That's how fear plays in and the, the police you arrested, so you're afraid to like show anything and show any emotions. I think it's, it's really important to share the validity of our emotions. And then there was something else that you had said. Oh, I know. You said in, in one of the interviews something like, I don't know if you call it God or spirit, you know, is it's perfect because clearly we have emotions for a reason. When we cry, we feel better, right? When we scream it out, we feel better. You said when we say the F word, we feel better. <laughs> there's actually scientific research showing that from Bre Brene Brown. But there's a reason. There, it's a release. And then we can do the work. Well, what does it mean to be, you know, I worked with Al Lowen and I would say, what is spirituality? He would say, you know, clear the emotional debris and live in your body, ground yourself. And that's what it means to be spiritual, to be spirited. Uh, I mean, if you flatline, if you keep flatlining your emotional life and calling that enlightenment, you're deluded. There's nothing, there's nothing expansive about that experience. You know, I mean, don't kill the self before it's time to go. Can I just read you? I just pulled up something I'd written about this whole male conditioning question. Yeah, please, Facebook. please. Yeah, okay. Okay, just to see and what the two of you think. Um, I moved beyond the limits of my male conditioning because I wanted to live more fully. Not because I felt there was anything wrong with being a man, but because I wanted to explore and experience a more inclusive way of being. My warrior consciousness granted me access to some paths and processes, but it made others impossible. 
so tightly held, so energetically and physically armored. I felt like I was serving a lifetime sentence inside my own bones. From deep within my constrained cell at Patriarchy Prison, I couldn't even begin to clear the emotional debris that I carried since childhood. I couldn't even begin to get to the bottom of the issues that plagued me. I was locked inside my pain, comfortable with anger but not tears, with edginess but not vulnerability, with a too restricted habitual range of emotion I was frozen in time. I couldn't feel, heal, grow, blah, blah, et cetera. Last paragraph. We don't embrace our feminine because we disdain our masculinity. We embrace it so that we can live complete lives. Actualization is a whole being experience. We become all that we can be when we embody all that we are. Becoming more gender inclusive is not a step backwards. It's a step towards liberation. Mm. That's beautiful and, and very deep and, and sounds like very much it encapsulates where you're at in your life experience. How do you relate to that, Mike, oh, as a man? Yeah. yeah, the point is the emotional process, it lives at the heart of that process, and it lives at the heart of everything. We have to call spirituality that which is inclusive of the emotional body, um, because we have to stop polarizing gender, we have to stop polarizing spirituality and humanness, we have to stop thinking politics and spirituality are, it's all part of the same experience. A true unified field requires that we bring everything human back into play um, and find our point of integration. And we have to give men the permission to express emotions in a positive way. Otherwise, it's going to come out sideways the way it is right now. 100%. Yeah, I mean, it's just so much repressed material. Mm -hmm. Repressed repressed emotions are unactualized spiritual lessons, and they're toxic. They congeal into weapons that are inward against the self. We have to permission emotional process, but we have to find ways societally to do it in a safe way. So I have a foam cube, as you mentioned, that I can hit. So we have those in offices. We have those in homes. We normalize healthy, appropriate emotional release so that it doesn't end up being mischanneled in the direction of innocence. Yeah, I, I, I want to circle back a little bit to what you said, because I think the polarization issue is, is really critical. I mean, we're just seeing right. it everywhere in the world right now, whether it's uh, male, female, whether it's racial, whether it's cultural, whether it's, I mean, the, the rise of nationalism. And that seems to me to always be rooted in someone's right and someone's wrong. And we have this viewpoint, I think, that we carry as a society where we always view in terms of right and wrong. And I don't think anyone's ever going to be completely half feminine, half masculine. I think that would be silly to think. How do we find it within ourselves and within our society to have respect for someone else's opinion, respect for someone else's makeup, to be really at the forefront so that we don't sit there and judge and polarize? Well, you know, I mean, I think so much of what's polarizing now is this wild gap between a survivalist consciousness and an authentic or more inclusive consciousness. This is a real consciousness war. Um, as progressiveness or inclusivity begins to take up more space, survivalist, especially unconscious survivalism, digs at its heels, clings to nationalism, and all kinds of other ridiculous things that go on. Um, so I think the only direction we can go is we can keep awakening to a more inclusive way of being, not one that's conditioned, not one that relies on what had happened ancestrally, not one that's duty role based, but that really is about moving into a more expansive uh, relationship to the moment. Um, and when you do that, you naturally begin to feel tolerant, not towards that which is unsafe that's different from you, but you become much more embracing of that which is uh, different from you and you also relate more to it because along your journey towards wholeness you've probably tapped into all kinds of archetypal ways of being you know i mean i can relate to a lot of unconscious ways of being because i feel like i've inhabited them for, for periods of time but, but you know we we i mean i think this battle is going to go on for a long long time um because it's it's the most real thing i've ever encountered you know Trump's world, whatever that is, is really real. You know, they're, they're, uh, it's unhealthy survivalism. What we want to move in the direction of is an authentic structure that incorporates survivalism, the importance of survival, but does it in a way that has some core ethical principles that has, is grounded in reality and has an inclusivity and a tolerance to it that that doesn't have. And so that we become survivalists, but we become survivalists that are rooted in an authentic way of being. I think that's the next step, and I think that's what this battle is about. 
I, I think you're right. There's definitely a, a war going on, like you said, in, inside of many people and now mirrored outside of many people in, in a, a bigger realm. So before we wrap up today, what I'd love to do is leave our audience with three actionable steps they can take in their life to, as you said, right. not go higher but deeper. Um, what would be three things, these women out there who are looking for inspiration and reinvention and rewiring at midlife, what are three things they can do in their own life to tap into the deeper spaces inside of themselves? Mm. I think uh, one of them is if they can afford to do somatic body-centered psychotherapy to work, bioenergetics, core energetics, somatic experiencing, some of the Reiki and stuff that's out there, to see that as part of the callings related work, trying to find their path about working in the emotional body. Because so much, when you clear the emotional debris, you get clarity as the path, and that you also transform in your consciousness in terms of purpose and path when you do deeper emotional work. So that's one part of it. The other part may be something I call solitude and soul shaping, which is trying to pull out of this overwhelming, overstimulating culture and create space and time for yourself to connect to your center, to find your way to your center. If I hadn't done years and years of that at a time when the world didn't move this quickly, I don't think I would have found the path I write from. Um, so that's kind of the second. And, and the third is, um, you know, to embrace relationship only to the extent that it truly serves your attempts to develop a clarity as to your path and purpose. Not to do it because that's what you think you're supposed to do, not to partner because that's beauty and role-based, um, but to make sure all of it is always aligning, and if you get clear inside, you can do this better and more effectively with what I call the sacred purpose that's encoded in the bones of the being. So to make sure whatever step you take, independent of the things you have to do to survive financially, which you always have to do, and you have to stay grounded about that, but to make sure other major life decisions are really rooted in a real clear seeing as to the, the steps that you're really taking in this lifetime. So you really take seriously your incarnation in a way that the culture and your family and your condition may never have taught you to. Thank you for thank you for that. And before you go, I want to make sure that our audience knows where to find you. That you have a new book coming out in February, and how to pre um, purchase that on pre-sale, and then also to attend, yeah. like you said, these writing courses that you have and the various offerings that you have. Right. So the, my main website is soulshaping.com. Um, my online school is soulshapinginstitute.com. I have a writing course that's starting uh, October 10th, coming up soon. I do it a couple of times a year. Um, my new book, Grounded Spirituality, should be out in February. It's up for pre-order on Amazon. Uh, you can go into any store and ask them to order it through Ingram Distribution to bring it into the store, which is always helpful. Um, and I do sometimes do uh, private sessions off my soulshaping.com website, but we're we're not going to activate that until this book goes into production, so probably about a month from now. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you for being here and, you know, delighted to connect with you personally, and I'll be continuing to stalk you in a very positive way online and <laughs> follow your writings. Great. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Awesome. Take care, Jeff. Have a great day. Yeah. All right. Well, well, that was a very interesting and, and deep conversation that I think we really need right now. Yeah, you know, look, we're, we're in a weird space in the world. I think for a long time people thought things were getting better. I don't think things are getting better right now. We've hit a standstill, and people are, are drawing a line in the sand, and people are standing on either side of that line, and there's not a lot of reaching across to make peace. And I think that's a real dangerous place for society to be. I think it's a dangerous place for our world to be. Um, it's a dangerous place for genders to be. And I think we really have to start erasing that line and reaching across. And, you know, you say that, and, and one of the easiest things to do is, is talk about politics in the past 10 years in our country. And you always hear, reach across the aisle. Well, no one's been reaching across the aisle for a long time. And I think we as a society and as a, as a globe need to start reaching across the aisle. Well, I think there's no way to um, find a solution to all the things, like you said, Me Too, Time's Up, all these things that are going on, unless we bring men and women into the conversation together. We certainly can't, you know, heal things on, other side of it, on either side of the divide. We have to come together, build a bridge, like you said. It's got to be from both sides. It's, it's really got to be a process 
of melding, melding ideas, melding thoughts, melding direction that we're going to go in. And um, I think we really are at a critical juncture right now, and a lot of things, as Jeff said, are probably going to be happening in the next few years that could, could change the way uh, and shape our lives. Well, I think it's important to talk about aging, too, and that's why we did Bridging the Gap. We literally did bridge a gap between ages. It was between a younger demographic and an older demographic, millennials and midlifers. We can do the same thing, men and women. We can do the same thing, politics. We can do the same thing, anything, to bridge the gap. And the purpose of that was to end divisions and blur boundaries. And the only way we can shift a perception, which is what Forever Fierce is about, it's shifting the perception of women at midlife and beyond, is to be able to expand our own perception. We can't shift our perception unless we're willing to hear you know, other people's perspectives. That's how we shift. The lullaby is fading. It's time for people to wake up and, and speak their truth and, and really do things that they want to do rather than what society tells you you're supposed to do. Yeah, he says wake down, but wake I, down, I, love, wake I love wake down, wake up, either way. Just wake, wake, be awake. I think that's really important. So thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for being here and for joining the conversation so we can bridge the gap and you know end the divisions and bring us all together because in the end don't we all want the same thing we want peace we want joy we want a happy life we want that for you so thank you so much for being here thank you for being part of the revolution um, please share the show if you like the show please leave um, uh, also a review on iTunes we would really appreciate that we want to get this word out so we can end divisions and be inclusive and put an end to ageism Let's put All an end isms. to the show. Let's All put isms. an end to the show. Put an end to the show. All right. Say goodnight, Gracie. On that, on <laughs> on that, I am a woman of few words. <laughs> All right, on that note, <laughs> cheers, beauties. Stay fierce.